Hey, how's it going, everybody? Sean here from Zoobox, and today for our daily movie review, we're going to be talking about Christopher Nolan's 2014 film, Interstellar. The film was written by Christopher Nolan and his brother, Jonathan Nolan. It stars Matthew McConaughey, Anne Hathaway, Jessica Ch- Chastain, Michael Caine, Wes Bentley, um, Timothy Chalamet, John Lithgow, Ellen Burstyn. Tons of people. More people than that. I left a bunch of them out. And the plot synopsis is a team of explorers travel through a wormhole in space in an attempt in an attempt to ensure humanity's survival. So, Interstellar. Well, I'm kind of a big Nolan fan, right? I mean, well, I know a lot of people seem to have some sort of weird hang-ups about Nolan. I've never, ever gotten it. I've never understood why people, I guess, like, just don't respond to his work. He's got such a technical a good grasp on just the technical side of filmmaking. You know, he's very detail oriented. He's very, he goes for it. Now, granted, I would, I would agree when people like the criticism that people give in terms of like, sometimes his scripts aren't great. Sometimes uh, he has a hard time kind of communicating melodrama effectively uh, without it seeming kind of saccharine or overdoing it. Um, A lot of his movies have that problem. There's kind of a coldness to them a little bit, a distance, which makes sense. I mean, if you know about Nolan, um, he's really into things like Michael Mann. He talks about all the time that Heat is one of his favorite movies. And if you watch something like The Dark Knight, well, that's just his version of Heat, basically. That's kind of what he set out to make Um, from a myriad of different ways. I mean, there's just direct homages to Heat in that movie. So it kind of makes sense that he would be a little colder. I mean, I think like his probably his crowning achievement in hindsight and the like things that he's done, his entire filmography is probably Dunkirk. Dunkirk is a incredible, incredibly well executed movie. Like it's kind of a marvel to watch. And it's a movie that gets better and better every time you watch it. Uh, Because a lot of Nolan stuff, other than maybe Inception and like The Dark Knight, like kind of took me a little while to appreciate. Um, You know, I've liked Nolan forever. I've, you know, even going back to his early days, I've liked his movie following. I really liked Memento when that came out. I was a big fan of Memento, even if it was just because of the gimmick, you know, it was clever at the time. It's still kind of novel a movie that plays in reverse. Uh, The fact that they were able to kind of make that coherent and actually weave it into the mystery and and the kind of the pace and the, the excitement of it, the thriller nature of it was impressive. But a lot of his other stuff, like it's taken me a few times, um, Dunkirk and today's topic, Interstellar. Uh, Interstellar, when I first saw it, I was kind of like, it was okay. Like I, I really, I liked it, but I didn't like, I didn't love it. I thought it was a little flat, maybe a little too sack or a little too corny. Like all the things I've said, he has a problem. He has problems with. I didn't respond very well to. I didn't respond to them at all, really. And over the years, I've revisited the movie. This is probably the fourth time I've watched it all the way through. And this time, I think a lot of what I used to have problems with, and I still have problems with a few things, but the sentimentality of it, like this kind of the theme of uh, love being kind of this force of nature in your life, um, I really responded to it this time, and I think becoming a father has everything to do with that. Because um, it's probably it's probably been since before my son was born, so three, four years. He's three now, so it's been at least three years since I've actually like sat down and watched Interstellar. And I was in it from the very beginning. I was just completely riveted, and I bought into the sentimentality. This time I completely got me hook, line and sinker. I was in it. I got misty eyed. I was, I was like a blubbering child a few times. Uh, Cause when you have a kid and that's like, you recognize the bonds and the sacrifice that he's making for his family and, uh, and how much it hurts him just as much as it, and, and how much it hurts his, his children and being gone for as long as he is like all the kind of, assumptions they have to make about the man that he was because they think he, you know, they don't know if he's dead or if he's alive or if he's ever coming back. So they have to kind of construct this person in their head 
of uh and wonder if he abandoned them you know some really powerful stuff in here and it's all done in like you know in just christopher nolan fashion just big and meticulous and well researched and all the space travel stuff the the world that they build they built like the the problems that are going on on with earth you know they took directly from the dust bowl era and like kind of um and and food shortages and stuff like that that happened back in the back in the old days i can't even remember exactly right now um but and then they weave this kind of interesting thing about the country trying to erase its own history so that people don't like <laughs> so people want to gear their lives towards making life work on the planet even though it's kind of a fool's errand. It's just going to fucking implode at some point. Uh, so they start rewriting history books about like, you know, no, we never actually went to the moon. It was a piece of propaganda to bankrupt the Russians. Um, just little things like that. There's all this little textual, textual, textual stuff that adds something to the movie uh, that adds something to the world without having to kind of go into long winded explanations about the state of the world that just kind of shows you it with like a few scenes, few conversations of exposition, but they don't really overdo it. I think, you know, one of the best scenes is when he goes to, when Matthew McConaughey's character goes to his children's school and they talk about the fact that she's brought in like this dissident material, this old history book into this, into the classroom. And it says that we landed on the moon and she's, and he's having a parent teacher conference and they're like, we never landed on the moon motherfucker. And he's like, motherfucker. Yes, we did. That's exactly, that's the lines from the movie. I'm sorry if that offends you. Um, but I love that kind of stuff. I love the world building in the movie. Um, and I like kind of the, this is, out of all of Nolan's movies, this feels like the most like Spielbergian. This feels like if Steven Spielberg would have directed this movie, he would have made this movie. This is 100% something Spielberg would have done. Maybe in the early like 2000s. Or the mid nineties, you know, it just feels like something akin to, or maybe like a, what's his name? Ron Howard is another person that comes to mind that might've done something like this at some point, because it has kind of that, those, those fundamentals of those kind of populist filmmaking proclivities that those guys have, but filtered through Nolan. So it's a little bit colder. It's like a little bit more serious. It's not as a, uh, not as fantastical he likes to ground his stuff Every, like even the worlds these people go to like these these astronauts trying to find a new place for humanity to settle like they're not like these giant crazy fantastical worlds it's like an ice planet a water planet and then it looks like kind of like a a deserty planet that Anne hathaway his character ends up kind of stranded or at building a base for um at the end of the movie so it's not like they don't even just try to do anything kind of wild with that shit. It just all feels like, yeah, I could, I buy this. <laughs> I buy this to a certain degree. I buy that this could happen. If it did happen, it would happen this way. Um, and I think uh, just like the sentimentality stuff to go back to that. Like, I think he filters it all in there very well, honestly. And, uh, and I really kind of like came around to really loving it loving how it ends loving everything about it and loving it about like being this being part of man's like grand journey towards saving itself like i'm i've, I've talked about this before uh, in these videos and on the podcast i do if you go listen to some of the older zoo box podcast episodes um like i'm a secular person and i kind of have this notion about humanity and about how we kind of divine these systems and, and heuristics, these, these structures. I think like religion is, I think is a, a construct of man. I think God is man's creation. I think about things in that kind of way. I think about humanity in that kind of way. Um, and I think that was a good thing. I think it's a useful heuristic. So people that remember uh, where we've come from. And um, so we don't forget, we don't forget the kind of ethical philosophical gains we've made over the years. We need something to house those things, something to remind people we need stories. Um, and I think in this movie interstellar, they kind of touch on that and they touch on it in kind of a groovy science fiction way. 
in the same way that like Stanley Kubrick touches on this stuff in 2001. Now, this isn't as grand of a metaphor as 2001. It's not as broad. It's much more sp- specific. But you can definitely tell that Nolan is somewhat inspired by Stanley Kubrick's 2001. Um, especially kind of this idea of Matthew McConaughey's character Cooper, you know, when he, he gets into a place where he's like basically outside of space and time, kind of like what happens at the end of 2001 and that there's some sort of, uh, he, he's been trapped in this, this thing that allows him to physically experience like that abstract thing. And he's able to interact with it. Um, and he's, he's got like an AI robot. That's just like, assuming that or telling him that that it must be aliens and he's like no this is not aliens this is us this is us from some point in time building the roads to get to that point in time you know and, you know it's kind of like the, I, it's like the paradox of time travel right i i don't think it's necessarily paradoxical i just think like if it ever does happen it always happened there is no changing things we are living in a in a timeline where Time travel was invented, and it's all already happened. There's nobody can ever go back and actually change anything. If we went back, we always went back. It's kind of like I, I think I was I was writing a short story years ago, and that was like my that was the title of the story. Is like if we if we go back, we always went back, or we've always gone back, something like that. Can't remember. I should save those things. <laughs> I never do. Um, but yeah, the movie touches on that kind of stuff. So I guess that maybe even more so like lended me or made me feel like I connected with it more. Um, and kind of, I like Cooper's character. I for, used to not like him because I f- kind of felt like he was a selfish guy, but it's kind of this idea of like, uh, our betters, you know, they have to make sacrifices so that all of us can kind of benefit from them. And if you're one of those people you're going to suffer a lot and stuff even if you are kind of in love with doing what you're doing like cooper clearly loves to explore he clearly loves like this journey this astronaut's wild trip this fucking thing he's been on but he also feels the pain of having not experienced his children grow up and their children grow up etc etc he is aware of that and he definitely feels for it and he feels disconnected from humanity kind of at the end and all he has left is the call to adventure basically that's the way the movie kind of ends and i think i wrote it off when i first saw it like i just kind of made the assumption that like oh well he's kind of a selfish asshole like but no not really he made a sacrifice i mean the movie he's really torn up about it the whole fucking movie and for him, it's, it hasn't been, you know, a hundred years or 80 years or however long. It hasn't been that long for him. It's only been a few months, maybe a year of his life. Yeah. So it's, I think it, it's one way more thoughtful than I gave it credit for uh, when I first saw it. And I also enjoy just like the dramatic twists and turns. I think Matt Damon actually, he, who is kind of surprised stunt casting. Nobody knew that Matt Damon was an interstellar before you saw it. Cause I'm pretty sure I saw it like when it opened. And so I had no idea. I had not been spoiled for me that Matt Damon showed up and he gives the kind of this great kind of quizzling, sniveling shithead performance. <laughs> He's like this, just this pathetic coward. And he, and he nails it and he kills it. I would say the whole cast is great. McConaughey in, in particular. Uh, McConaughey, I think this is kind of an underrated McConaughey performance. He's really going for it. This was in that time of his career, the McConaissance. Where he, so he has like a string of movies. This, that, uh, not drugstore cowboy. What about the AIDS medication? Where he's like, like a cowboy. <laughs> um... What the fuck is that movie called? It's going to bother me now. Uh, yeah, but he was so he he just swings for the fences. He goes for it. He's very uh, Dallas Buyers Club. There you go. Now I can let go of it. Dallas Buyers Club. He does Magic Mike, Killer Joe, Mud. Uh, he did a bunch of stuff around this time that were all like a string of just great performance. True Detective came out the same year. Interstellar came out um, since then, though. 
he's only done no, he hasn't really had any hits since then. I know people like the Beach Bum. Uh the gentleman, he was really good in the new Guy Ritchie movie, actually. He was pretty good in that. Um, but yeah, so this was definitely I guess the end of the Meconnaissance kind of. Bernie. Oh my god, Bernie's so good. Yeah, this is the end of the Meconnaissance. This like he made a string of just great movies with all like stellar star making performances and did it for like four years back to back to back to back. And uh, yeah, and I think Interstellar is kind of an underrated performance. It's way more nuanced uh, than I definitely when I gave it than I gave it credit for when I first saw it. I mean, it is a movie that has, grows on you, I think, and especially the more life experience the ha- you have, if you have a family of your own, if you have any kind of tragedies, if you have kind of any kind of ambition and you struggle with your ambition relative to your responsibilities, um, I think you can really com- uh, connect with this character. And the kind of the plight of all the characters, and uh, the fact that there is, it is probably a more or less realistic possibility scenario of kind of the end of the road for humanity, and what humanity might have to do to kind of circumvent annihilation as a species. It's definitely interesting, and I know they did a lot of research, just like Nolan always does. Everything's super meticulous and well well-crafted and every piece of equipment and spaceships and every shot with space exploration is supposed to feel real and engrossing. And I, I think it is, I think it is the production design in this movie is incredible. Um, just top to bottom. I mean, every penny of this budget is on screen, every fucking penny. It's one of the most impressive science fiction movies, like from just an aesthetically, just aesthetic reasons, attention to detail that uh, maybe ever made, but certainly made since. I don't know. I want to say, you know, I'm, I'm thinking 2001, but that's probably not fair. I'm sure there's something in between, but it reminded me a lot of 2001 in a sense. And uh, 2001, the space odyssey is one of my all time favorite movies. Another movie that I didn't actually, I didn't love when I first saw it, you know, something that grew on me over the years as I got older. I think Interstellar has going to have that kind of life with people, especially people my age. As you just get older and you're heading into middle age, uh, I think you're going to respond to a lot more of what the movie is kind of putting out there. Um, I I do think it's got some awkwardness, though. I, I don't love the pacing of the beginning of the movie. And they do this interesting thing where they mix actors and real people that survived the Dust Bowl era stuff and they give like these talking head like documentary cutaway things, and it's revealed at the end of the movie that this is like something that you're seeing on their kind of colony spaceship thing that they've built. Uh, these like hubs for people to live on these space stations, and they so you find out it's from that from from those things in the, in like a hundred years in the future people reflecting on their time in the during the famine and whatnot, but it, it is awkwardly inserted a few times in like the first 45 minutes of the movie. And then it kind of never goes back to it until the very end of the movie. And it's a long movie. It's two hours and 49 minutes. I mean, it's almost three hours long. So it's, so when it's only in there for the first like 45 minutes or so, and then it just kind of disappears. It feels like a weird conceit that just didn't belong there. Um, but like I said, it's kind of cool. It is real people, people from the Dust Bowl era that were talking about their experiences. So, and then they mixing that in with the fiction. It's just an interesting, it was an interesting experiment. I don't know if it's completely successful, but I like the thought behind it. I think it's very thoughtful. It's a, kind of a cool idea. But the one also the, the, probably the MVP of the movie, and this isn't always the case. I'm, I don't always love this guy, but the, uh, the composer Hans Zimmer, Hans Zimmer fucking nails this out of the park. Now he does most Nolan movies. I really love his score for inception in particular. Uh, his, his, his stuff with the Batman Nolan stuff that he did was also fantastic. Um, but yeah, he just this weird kind of orchestral, it was like a minimalist orchestra with like organs with these like church organs. And it is gorgeous. 
It is so beautiful. It's like hard not to get like wrapped up in it. And you just feel emotional. You know, it just, it, it engages with the sentimentality just kind of openly. And, uh, I think it's really successful. It's one of my favorite parts of the movie. Like I would buy this soundtrack on vinyl. I'd buy the score on vinyl in a fucking heartbeat. Like it's so good. If you've ever seen the movie Watchmen, actually Watchmen has a very similar piece of music. Um, during the Dr. Manhattan creation sequence of that movie, the Zack Snyder movie, um, which is very reminiscent of interstellar. But I like that because it, it kind of like is, it has this sort of interesting implication that this is that exploration is kind of the, is, is the destiny of mankind and that it's kind of a religious experience. There's something holy about it, something worth fighting for and worth preserving and don't kind of let humanity fall into apathy. So it even kind of underlines the subtext of the movie and what the character's journey kind of like, let's not forget to keep going. Let's just not get complacent because of technology. Use that technology to take us further into the stars, right? But yeah, it's, it's a beautiful score, uh, beautifully, beautifully implemented as well. Um, like, I, is it original? Maybe it's, is it not original? I don't know if it's an original one. I'm looking at his composer stuff. Let's see here. 2014 as a composer. That would be embarrassing. No, it's he composed. Okay, cool. Cool. We could have had a real embarrassing moment. I mean, the guy does tons and tons of scores very prolific um and i have always he's very solid he always does something interesting but he's also kind of like danny elfman in this in the in a sense for some of his stuff where it's like feels redundant everything kind of bleeds together but he's got a few standout ones i would say his inception score his interstellar score his dunkirk score is also another incredible score that feels like a part of the movie in a way that is much deeper than somebody just writing a score for a movie. Um, it actually it's like part of the sound design of the movie in like in a, in a way that not all scores are. It's actually like utilized in the movie. Um, Rango. He did Rango. Yeah. I, I love, love me some Hans Zimmer. He was play. He, he was doing like live concerts. Not that long ago. If he ever does one again, and it comes around here. I think I might go, I might try to score some tickets. So, and he gets up there and he like plays the fucking guitar. He does the Wonder Woman theme. If you've ever seen a uh, Batman v Superman, which is a fucking rad guitar riff. So I like it. I liked it. I like him. Yeah. Uh, I, I was very struck with this movie this, this time I really was really taken with it. Um, it would probably make the top 50 of my favorite movies upon revisit. I'm very curious to see how I'm going to feel about Inception. It's been a few years since I've watched Inception. Like, just actually just sat down and watched it. Like I said, I think I said at the beginning of this video. Everything's bleeding together. Um, I think I'm going to try to check that out in IMAX. And then I'm going to just kind of watch other Nolan movies. I'm going to kind of go back through his filmography a little bit and just, uh, just enjoy myself, you know? I got... Got this this triple this triple disc here. I got Insomnia. I have not watched Insomnia in a long time. The remake of that French movie. Which I always thought was weird. It was a weird choice that he did that. But Pacino, Robin Williams, R.I.P. Hilary Swank. Come on now. <laughs> I got some stories about Insomnia. I'll save it for uh, that video. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks for listening. I appreciate it. I really do from the bottom of my heart. Um. If you'd like to know more about Zoobox, if you want to keep up to date with Zoobox Nation, there's a bunch of links in the description for Facebook, for Instagram, for my personal Twitter. Lots of memeing. On my Twitter, I talk about kind of the movies I'm watching. So if you want to get a preview of some of the videos, you follow me on Twitter. I usually will drop something about what I'm watching on Twitter. Um, also, if you'd like to make a request for one of these videos, these daily videos or something for the big show, for Zoobox Goes to the Movies, leave it in the comments. I'll get around to it. I'll put it on the list. I'll, I'll watch pretty much anything. So if you even you want to put something fucked up on there just to see if I'll do it, you never know. You might be surprised, buddy. All right.
You guys have a great one.